Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Books Network. I'm Tiadam Sulongkumar, the host of this channel, and today I'm here with Dr. Gregory Shushan to talk about his book, The Next World, Extraordinary Experiences of the Afterlife. Now, this book talks about near-death experiences and how do we understand near-death experiences and goes into the deep well of work by the author himself through his lifelong work in near-death experiences. So this is a very dense work, which I was very interested in because near-death experiences is something which uh, is very is a very interesting phenomena that I'm sure everyone, one way or the other way, have might have experienced it or might have gone through the literature. So this work is something which was very fascinating to me and interesting to me and i'm sure the listeners will also be fascinated by the conversation and then the huge array of work of the author himself so let me go straight away to the author himself and ask something about uh, himself so dr shushan can you tell us something about yourself okay uh thanks dia um and thanks for having me on it's a real real pleasure to to be on and talk to, to a new audience um so yeah, I'm a historian of religions is probably the best uh, category that, that I would uh, slot myself into. Uh, I started out doing um, Eastern Mediter- Mediterranean and Egyptian archaeology, um, and then I sort of transitioned from there to religious studies uh, for my PhD. So I, I kind of ended up getting a cross-disciplinary uh, sort of background, uh, which, which informs my work quite a lot. So um, yeah, even though... Uh, you know, history of religions is no longer really a, a field or discipline. That's kind of how I, I would situate myself. Really. Um, and I've looked at, uh, you know, starting out with, with the ancient world, looking at, um, you know, ancient Egypt and Sumer and China, um, India, and Mesoamerican civilizations of uh, Maya and Aztec. And then, and that was obviously, you know, my, given my background in archaeology, I was a little more familiar with that. But then I did my second study looking at um, uh, new, uh, new death experience in indigenous religions. And that was looking at um, uh, Africa, the Pacific, and uh, Native American cultures around the world. Thank you for that. Now, around the world, you are also known as one of the prominent scholar in the near death experience study. And now this book has come about. Now, so my question is, what led you to study the near death experiences? And also, um, why this book? It, is it more of a collection of your previous works that you, you have done? So why this book? And what led you to study near death experiences? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've always had an interest in them ever since I, I heard about near death experience. I should maybe clarify just very quickly for listeners who don't know, some people think a near-death experience is just that you almost die, but it's not that. It's that you almost die or you're temporarily dead and you have experiences that seem to be out-of-body experiences in some other realm where you go through darkness and meet a being of light and maybe meet deceased relatives and have you know, kind of mystical feelings and you come back to your body. So, so that's specifically the kind of experience I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, I, I, when I, from ever the, the time I first heard about them, I thought it was such an interesting thing. And then when I learned that they existed cross-culturally, it kind of inspired my, my interest even more because at first I thought, well, it, they could be true, but they could just be, you know, a, a you know, Western Christian cultural thing. Cause I'd read Raymond Moody and, and whoever. Um, but once I started kind of coming across different examples from around the world, and then uh, when I was doing my Egyptology degree, I, I was uh, you know reading the books of the dead and the coffin texts and these these early funerary texts and noticed that there were descriptions of the afterlife in these texts that sounded a lot like near-death experiences. So, um, you know, the soul leaves the body, travels through darkness, uh, comes out and meets a being of light who's the sun god in the Egyptian uh, conception. Um, They meet relatives, they have a a life review, Uh, they even encounter their own corpse in the form of the the god of the dead, Osiris, because the, the, the person is associated with Osiris. So it's essentially when they, when they come across Osiris in the other world, it's like coming across their own corpse. So there's all these kind of symbolic uh, connections, I think, between afterlife beliefs and near-death experiences uh, in, in these different religions. Um, as for why this book in particular, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. It's um, basically my, my first book was called Conceptions of the Afterlife in Early Civilizations 
and it's a fairly scholarly book. It's, you know, d- deals quite a bit with um, the problem of comparison in, you know, comparing religions, because that's been uh, criticized in, you know, since the, the 60s or, or whatever, that, you know, we shouldn't compare religions. Um, the field used to be called comparative religion, and then, you know, it changed to the study of religions. So, I, you know, I defended comparison, and I defended the concept that there's similarities around the world and different beliefs. Um, and then the second book um, is also, um, it's called Near-Death Experience in Indigenous Religions. That was with Oxford University Press, and that's also, you know, fairly scholarly. I tried to get away a little bit more from the, the narrow disciplinary um, concerns uh, of religious studies, and I tried to use kind of less academic jargon, but it still is, you know, it's a fairly, it's a scholarly work. Um, so I thought, you know, people are always asking me, oh, you're, you know, you're writing on near-death experiences, and I, and I can't say, well, go buy this book, it's $85, and it's a scholarly book on NDEs. So I wanted to write something that was more accessible and available to not just scholars in different disciplines, uh, but that was a main thing, but also just to the general reading public, anybody who's interested in um, not just like what near-death experience, what's the evidence of whether whether they're evidence for an afterlife or not, but what's going on in uh, different cultures and throughout history with these kinds of accounts. Yeah, thank you for explaining that one. Now, you have said something about near-death experience uh, now, but I want you to elaborate more. Now, there are so many experiences uh, that are out there and also, I mean, near-death experience is something which also I believe uh, people understand might understand it in a very different way. So what really is this near-death experience in that sense? Uh, yeah, I would, you know, phenomenologically just as a, as a descriptive thing, it's as I was saying, it's basically a person is near death or they, or they um, think they're near death sometimes. You don't even necessarily have to be near death. Or in some cases, they're clinically dead for a time and brought back to life. And they come back from being unconscious for whatever reason and they say, um, you know, I had this amazing experience. I left my body. I could see my body lying there below. Then I found myself in another world. Or they'll say I, I you know, went through a, some dark tunnel or some dark passageway, um, came out into a realm of light. I met Jesus or I met the Buddha or I met Muhammad or I met Krishna or whoever. Um, and I also saw my uncle or my aunt or my mother or father or whoever. And then uh, this deity or being or relative told me, it's not your time to die. You need to, you need to go back to your body. Um, and then I woke up in my body. That's, that's the kind of, you know, the basic outline. And then uh, on top of that, there's all kinds of different sub-experiences that people can have that seem to be determined either by culture or by uh, how long the person was unconscious or, or temporarily dead. So, for example, the life review um, very popular in, in movies and books about near-death experiences, but actually it's very rare, especially in uh, small-scale indigenous societies. So the idea of your life flashing before your eyes and you experience every moment of your life and condensed into just a few seconds, and it's also a sense of uh, self-judgment because you experience um, your actions towards other people uh, as if it's happening to you. So it's, it's kind of a, a karmic resolution in your afterlife. Um, this is actually very, very rare um, in, in uh, Western NDEs, despite how popular the, the theme is. So there's a lot of um, you know, cross-cultural differences as well as uh, similarities. You, you say in your book that near-death experience is a common experience type that is circularly interpreted in religious terms across cultures. Now, I wanted to ask about this one. Historically, in different cultures, you also say that or you argue that near-death experiences have been there. So how was these near-death experiences understood across cultures generally, right, in history? And, you know, how, how was it interpreted? Yeah, well, they're almost always interpreted as what they seem to be. Uh, which is, you know, what happens when you die, because the person is apparently dead. You know, we can't evaluate, you know, medical technology in past societies or the degree to which a person might have been dead or not. But from the point of view of the society, uh, generally speaking, you know, the person appears to be dead. They might have been preparing their funeral. They might have been, you know, having other kinds of rituals around the body or the, the body might have been lying in state for a few days waiting for the burial to occur. But generally speaking, um, it's in a death context, and then the person wakes up, and to all and you know to to this to the people their community around them, 
they came back from the dead. So, uh, so just that basic thing of, of, you know, the meaning being, this is what happens when you die is, is, I don't want to say universal, uh, cause there are exceptions, but it's pretty stable across cultures. Um, and that's one of the really interesting things. Cause to me as you know, the similarities are really interesting, but the differences are in some ways even more interesting. So if we look at, uh, sub-Saharan African cultures, um, going back to sort of 19th century, um, 18th century as well, up to the 30s or 40s. Um, they didn't always interpret near-death experiences as somebody who died and came back to life, but rather as um, that body has been possessed by a, an evil spirit or that corpse has been resurrected by a sorcerer. Um, and so they were um, you know, rather hostile and, and suspicious of, of the walking dead, you know, um, they didn't. They, there was no joy of like, um, wow, my my uh, mother returned from the dead. I'm going to go embrace her, and um, you know, th- there wasn't this uh, you know excitement of reintegrating her back to the community and and uh, this this kind of miraculous event like like we might see it. So um, so yeah, for the most part, I would say uh, they were greeted in in an afterlife sort of context, and and usually. Uh, with with pleasant surprise if the person came back to life, but it is you know culturally determined. There's also in uh, Micronesia and Australia, Australia, there's examples of um, where it's not necessarily a really sort of welcome uh, thing, and and this is reflected even in uh, funerary rituals, where for example, um, in especially in Africa and Micronesia, they would bind the corpses uh, once they were dead, um, you know, tie their hands and feet together, they'd pile pile stones on top of the grave essentially to make sure that that person wouldn't come back to life. So not only is it interpreted differently, but it's actually then um, inhibiting the possibility of more NDEs happening, uh, which is preventing it from being integrated more and more into the culture. Yeah. Now, as you, have ex- as you explained that near death experience is something which is a common phenomenon. Now, I wanted to know about the aspects that induces near death experiences because also there are instances where people do not have near death experiences in that sense. So um, there might be like social cultural phenomena, the person's personal experiences or a psychological makeup of that person. And also, oh, now you also talk about, uh, I mean, there is also the verticality of it, uh, the verticality of the near-death experiences in that sense. So what are the aspects that induces these near-death experiences? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, we need to make a distinction between near-death experience, which even itself is not a very good descriptor because some of them should be called temporary death experiences because the person has been determined to be clinically dead for a period of time. Um, but then these strange effects, these strange experiences can also happen when the person is only near death. Um, there's a separate category, category called fear death experiences, um, where people only fear that they're going to die. Uh, the classic examples of that is when someone is drowning, um, but they're not actually um, in danger of death. They just think they're going to drown, but they're rescued before, you know, they're, they're actually physically um you know, compromised as, as far as being close to death goes, or also falling from a, a, a cliff or a mountaintop. Um, there's a lot of examples of this in a study from the 19th century where um, people would, have, you know, th- this uh, a geologist uh, collected a lot of these examples and people would, would fall off from a great height and on the way down, they would have, you know, usually a life review and some kind of other near-death experience, but they landed and maybe would break their arm or even just be completely unharmed. Um, then there's even accounts where somebody is just, you know, sitting at a desk and suddenly find themselves out of his body in another world, um, and was not even sick or anything. So, uh, it, it does definitely cross over with other kinds of unnamed, you know, generic mystical experiences or, or out of body experiences or whatever. Uh, but the context is usually, um, related to, to death and dying. Now, I want to come to the theological or other uh, metaphysical implications of the near-death experiences. In that sense, near-death experiences, as you mentioned, is seen more as a revelation in that sense, right? So how do we understand near-death experience as a form of revelation? Uh, Yeah, I think that can be seen as revelation in various ways. For one thing, I mean, in the most common, typical sense of the word, people actually do receive 
you know, quote unquote revelations in the other world from some kind of divine being or spirit being. Um, often they're told, you know, you need to go back and and teach, you know, the certain way of life. You need to teach that, um, you know, um, people need to be kinder to each other or teach that even just that there is an afterlife. So if people know that there's an afterlife, they have a different kind of way of living life on earth. They have a, a new kind of hope and a new spiritual orientation on earth. Uh, there's also very specific uh, instructions sometimes, uh, often in the Native American examples, uh, they're told to go back and either uh, kind of cooperate with the white European invaders, basically make your life easier, go back and integrate with um, with white Europeans and adopt their technology, trade with them. Um, and then in other cases, it's go back and in order to preserve your culture, you need to rebel against the white European invaders and, you know, stop using their weapons, stop eating their food, uh, reclaim your culture. And then these, um, these kinds of messages end up being turned into, into or being the foundation for religious revitalization movements in a lot of these uh, cultures. And that's not just in Native Americans, but there's also examples in the Pacific and South America and other places where um, yeah, the revelation actually leads to a, a whole new kind of religion. But then in another sense, um, just the fact of having an, an NDE is really um, revelatory in the sense of the nature of the other world, ostensibly, uh, is is revealed to the person who has it. So so there this whole uh, glimpse of of the life to come, the feeling that um, we're not our bodies, and that uh, we we don't die. All we do is trans transition to another state of being. Um, that's you know in a sense is, is a revelation in itself. Coming to the near-death experience in religion, now you kind of argue or kind of suggest that you know uh, we we can see these implications of near-death experiences in religions in that sense. And obviously, coming to Christianity, we have this apocalyptic literature, or you know, historically we we see so so much of these revelatory experiences, or so much of this message from the other world. So, how do you argue or understand the prevalence of near-death experiences in religion? Uh, how much prevalent is it, or you know, the significance of it in that sense, near-death experience? Experiences in religion, yeah, yeah. I think it would. Um, it really varies from case to case. So, for example, the uh, the African, Melanesian, Australian examples, um, it wasn't really integrated into the religions, um, except for in the sense of, you know, it uh, it helps cement ideas about possession and sorcery or whatever. Um, in Australia, they had uh, shamanic traditions that you know took them to the other world and they would go to the other world and, and talk to the ancestors and those experiences read very much like ndes but they were deliberately uh, induced so they weren't spontaneous like a near-death experience so in a sense i'm not sure if they weren't having them or if they were just interpreting them as shamanic or what it's, it's kind of difficult to, to puzzle out so in a, a case like that it's it's hard to say but in uh you know probably the best example of you know, overt examples where the people themselves say, um, we know about the afterlife because so-and-so died and came back to life, uh, are from Native American and Polynesian societies. Uh, just from Native American, I, I had something like 70 examples of NDEs and, and of those, you know, 40 or something where, where they actually said, um, you know, whether they were talking to a missionary or an anthropologist or an explorer, they said, um, however many years ago, so-and-so died, went to the other world. And then they would describe what that person had, uh, the, the experiences that person had, and they would say, uh, and this is how we know um, what the afterlife is like. Um, as far as, you know, uh, historic, as opposed to prehistoric or, or ahistoric religions, it's difficult to say. I mean, Pure Land Buddhism, you know, particular strand of, of Buddhism, um, there's a lot of foundational near-death experience type stuff going on there. Um, so, so a lot of the afterlife beliefs in Pure Land Buddhism seem to have arose from from NDEs. There's examples from Vedic India. There, there's a, a famous uh, account of a little boy in, um, called Nachiketas from the Upanishads, who his father kills him and he goes to the other world and he has a conversation with Yama, who's the god of death. And Yama reveals to him all these secrets of the nature of the soul and the nature of the afterlife. And then he's sent back. And that's part of a whole sort of Vedic stream of um, 
returned from death accounts. Christianity is a bit of a puzzle because uh, you would think that a religion that's based, you know, revolves around the death and return of of one man uh, in the form of Jesus would maybe have, you know, some near death experience accounts, but there there is basically none in either the the Old Testament or the New Testament. There there are some in the Apocrypha and, and accounts of saints, and especially from medieval Europe. But the actual, you know, the official documents in the Bible, there's no NDE. There's some apocryphal text of Jesus called the Harrowing of Hell, which describes his uh, journey to hell during the time that he was dead, once he was taken down from the cross and before he came back out from the cave. Um, and it says that he went to the other world and he freed um, the, the souls of the dead who, who were in hell. Um, but it's apocryphal and it, and it reads very much like a literary text. So I actually wonder if, you know, it, it's very speculative, you know, I completely admit it, but I do wonder if, if NDEs might have formed a more important role in Christianity and maybe at the Council of Nicaea or some other stage, uh, they were kind of deleted and, and, uh, and removed from it because as Mormons have realized, you know, in, in Mormon belief, uh, they like near-death experiences because it shows that revelation and direct interaction with God is still possible. It's not just this ancient biblical thing, but it can happen to each and every one of us. And that's kind of antithetical to what, um, you know, mainstream Christianity wants to teach. And maybe at the Council of Nicaea, they thought, no, the way through God, the way to God is through Jesus and only through Jesus. It's not through individual experience such as an NDE. So it makes sense to me that it might've been, um, you know, suppressed and maybe reimagined because, you know, there's so many accounts of saints having NDEs that, that it's difficult to, to think that, um, you know, they didn't exist in Christian thought before that. Yeah, very interesting perspective. I mean, having studied Christianity for my research work also, I mean, haven't thought about <laughs> that aspect in the sense, so that's a very interesting perspective. Now you have a book on near-death experiences in indigenous religions. Now the listeners can go and, you know, have a look at that book. But uh, I want to ask something about where you mentioned about shamanism and then the induced form of near-death experiences. So in, in shamanism, how is this near-death experience get induced does it get induced through certain ritualistic form or certain postures of the body or how does it happen? Yeah. Well, I guess I would back up a little bit and say, I would, I, I make a distinction in this book and also in, in the next world. Uh, the next world has a, um, as a kind of case study from, from the indigenous religions book. It has a kind of, um, or at least a chapter based on it about the, um, the Pacific uh, afterlife beliefs. But yeah, I, I make a distinction uh, between shamanistic um, afterlife or otherworldly experiences and actual near-death experiences, and that's just based on the context. So, if an, if the experience is uh, spontaneous and it involves temporarily dying and coming back, then it's a near-death experience. But if it's deliberately induced, um, then I consider it a, a shamanic one. And yeah, those shamanic experiences they have various ways of being induced according to the culture. So, uh, for example, there's a, in Africa, there was a society called the Fang people, and they um, used a drug called um, Ibogaine, and that's a sort of drug manifestation of, the, of a god named Iboga, um, which is kind of similar to Soma in, in, uh, in the Vedas. Um, Soma is a god, but it's also this ritualistic drug that enables um, you to see the light of heaven and all this, this other kind of, um, kind of mystical descriptions. Um, but yeah, they, they would take massive quantities of this drug, um, ibogaine, and essentially induce a near-death experience. And, and in some cases, they would even say uh, he took so much that he died and then he came back to life. So there's a real gray area um, between it being an actual near-death experience and being a, a deliberately induced one. And some of them, I think, they probably did take so many drugs um, or, or um, deprive their bodies in, in some way that they actually had an NDE. Other methods are, um, you know, repetitive dancing and chanting to the point of exhaustion and collapse. And while they're doing that, they have it in mind that when they collapse, they're gonna, their soul is going to leave the body and go to the other world. Uh, this is a very typical thing in Native American examples like the ghost dance religion, uh, the dreamer religion, the Indian shaker church. Um, that was the kind of uh, explicit goal of that is, is to uh, 
drive your body to, to such a state that it collapses and you can go to the other world and, and either commune with the ancestors or also retrieve the soul of somebody who's in danger of dying. So essentially, the shaman would go after somebody who's having an NDE, uh, bring them back to their body, and then that person would, would wake up. Yeah. Now I want to come to telepathy or mediumship. You suggest that mediumistic description of the afterlife are infused with contemporary spiritualistic attitudes to racial and religious diversity, which also follows historical changes of social consciousness over time. Now, in terms of this mediumship through near-death experiences, right? So how does it happen or how does it work? Well, I mostly looked at 19th century accounts and early 20th century accounts. And the main goal of doing that was to try to determine descriptions of the afterlife that came through mediums, uh, it, how much they uh, correspond to near-death experience descriptions. So um, to do that, I mean, I didn't, I didn't dwell too much on whether the accounts are true or not, just as I don't really with near-death experiences. It's more about um, their relationship to religion and, and belief and and then also uh, how we might be able to integrate them into a belief in an afterlife, if, you know, if we wanted to, to go in that direction. But with the mediumship, it's it's difficult because the there's a lot of claims made about mediumship in both ways, and and a lot of the best psychical research done on mediumship was was 19th and early 20th centuries, and that's why I pick those eras. I, I think that um, you know some of the some of the best accounts come from there, and what I tried to do is take accounts of the afterlife, descriptions of the afterlife from the most well-regarded mediums of the time. Uh, so Leonora Piper is, is one famous one, um, Geraldine Cummings and a few others. Uh, and I did find that there were general similarities with near-death experiences. They would say, um, you know, you leave your body, you go to the other world, and there's this um, being who emanates light and you see your deceased ancestors, all these familiar kinds of things from NDEs. But they're also um, even more enculturated, I would say, than NDEs. I mean, I mentioned before that you know NDEs, they're they're in some societies they they don't have life reviews, and some they do. Um, another good example is in small scale societies, they walk along a road or a path rather than you know shooting through a dark tunnel. So in a lot of the Edwardian and Victorian English and American uh, descriptions, it very much reflects their conceptions of society and their ideals of society at the time. So a good example of that is, is some of the um, English descriptions. Essentially, they would say there are seven layers to the afterlife. Um, we're on the, on the lowest layer, you know, we're below the afterlife realms, and this is the base, worst level of all. And you go up to the next one, and it's a kind of um, rarefied, idealized duplicate of England. And then the second layer is an even better, more rarefied duplicate of England. And you go all the way to seven levels, and each one is just a better idealization of what their life actually is, um, you know, the kind of ideal middle-class English life at the time. But unfortunately, um, and this is where it's kind of significant for people who want to believe that, that any of this is true, uh, they then impose their ideas about race and class and gender onto the afterlife realms that the, the medium is, is um, supposedly communicating. So for example, they would say um, slaves and servants in the other world are still slaves and servants, and they're happy to be because they're not ready to be emancipated. You know, they're not spiritually advanced enough to even desire their own emancipation. And then they'll say, um, you know, people are, are will, will have the kind of afterlife that maybe they expect. So, you know, a Japanese Buddhist, for example, will come into a sort of pure land realm. Um, but eventually they will all realize that the way to true spirituality is through Jesus and Christianity. Um, another example is they would say uh, there's segregation in the other world, but it's not because, um, you know, white people are dictating it, but that's just the way the world works. And because people of color are just happier and more comfortable in their own uh, kind of realm. And also that the higher up you go in each level, the whiter your skin becomes. You know, really kind of, um, you know, there's, there's eugenics infused in it and all kinds of, you know, quite, quite dubious, racist, classist kind of stuff. So, and the reason that's problematic is because, I mean, obviously it's problematic for a lot of reasons, but 
if they're claiming that this is a real representation of the afterlife and that it's a universal vision of the afterlife, um, it's, I find it really difficult to accept that an afterlife would be basically a white Christian supremacist place. Now you talk about the philosophical implication of this with the caveat that if spirit communication is genuine, right, or the spiritual realm is genuine, and that is, um, there should be a different philosophical implication in that sense if it is genuine, because obviously all the philosophy that we do here should not only be implicated to the you know contextual realm that we or the milieu that we are living here, but it should be, I mean, our philosophical uh, discourse and implication should consider the otherworldly aspect of it if it is genuine. So in your mind, what are some of the philosophical implications in that sense? Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, just um, going from that last example, to me, the only way that I can reconcile that with the idea that there could really be an afterlife and with near-death experiences and the similarities and differences between near-death experiences is that there is this either a stage or process by which the other world is, is sort of largely imaginal. It's I think of it as, as a possible lucid dream um, where, where um, you know, you're actually awake in your dreams and you're aware that you're dreaming, but the dream itself isn't necessarily that much changed just by your awareness that, that you're in it. So the background of the dream and the people in the dream and, and the story or the plot or whatever are basically the same. It's just that you're, you're thinking, wow, I'm dreaming. I, I know that I'm um, actually lying in bed asleep, but I'm in this other world and it seems just as real as the world in which my body is, you know, when I wake up in the morning. So, you know, if we, if we kind of envision the afterlife in this, as this kind of partly like a lucid dream, then it makes sense for people to be saying things like, you know, each each England is just, each level is just a better England. And, and, you know, maybe um, if, if you want to be more comfortable thinking that your servants are going to be there and that, you're not going to have to live around people of color or whatever, then that's the kind of vision of an afterlife you're, you're going to um, kind of create. Uh, and then there's also the, the idea that H.H. Um, H. Price, who's an Oxford philosopher um, in, the, in the 50s mostly, I think he wrote 30s, 30s through 50s, um, he had this idea of group souls in the afterlife so that, so that uh, you would kind of combine your lucid dream, as it were, with the souls of other like-minded people. So you could kind of create your, your own um, realm that, that kind of mirrors your, the realm that you came from on earth. So that seems to make sense to me. Um, and another thing that I, that I wonder is, you know, if there is really an afterlife, if there is a life after death, it should really be after lives or, or, uh, you know, different lives after death, because, uh, you know, near-death experiences only happen to 15 or 20 percent of people who come close to death and, and get revived. So that begs the question of what about the rest? You know, what kind of do they are they not going to have an afterlife when they die or are they not going to remember it? Or are they going to go to some other totally different experience or did they just were they not dead long enough? Um, and then is it the case that some people reincarnate and some don't? So it's um, I don't think that these are necessarily insurmountable problems for people who want to believe in an afterlife because I also don't see any reason uh, that an afterlife would have to be the same for everybody. Um, I, I think that I don't think that's a valid argument philosophically or otherwise, uh, but it's just um, it's uh, difficult to conceptualize in, in different ways without allowing for, for diversity. Coming to reincarnation and report, right? Uh, people remember instances of life or places that they haven't visited, and they remember the places and things in in the right place or in the right order as it was. So now there are arguments uh, regarding this, and you uh, also mentioned cryptomancia and subconscious fantasies and intermission. I mean, intermission memories and all, all of those aspects. So in terms of these narrative experiences. Uh, how do we understand reincarnation or rebirth in that sense? Yeah, yeah. As you said, there, there's it's usually children who who remember these past lives, sometimes from the age of two or even even younger, and they start saying, you know, I want to go see my other mommy, and I remember when I worked in a factory in my previous life, or uh, there's a famous case of a little boy, James Leninger, who remembered dying in a plane crash in World War II, 
And there's a Japanese case of, of a kid who remembers dying on a, on a battleship. And he was from the you know, very young age. He's obsessed with this particular ship, knows what happened on the ship, which side of it got bombed, all this kind of stuff, which is very difficult to explain otherwise. Um, and they've been researched by some, some really good researchers and good scholars. But as, you know, as with the other stuff, my, my main interest is not proving or disproving whether these cases are true or not. My main interest as far as reincarnation cases go are the intermission memories. And that's essentially when the child will also say, not just that they remembered their past personality, but they remember that past personality dying, right? I should say they remember the, the dying experience that they had when they were that past personality. So they can say, you know, I was hit by a bus or whatever. I remember leaving my body. I saw my body lying there. I hung around. I tried to contact my, my parents. They couldn't hear me because I was just a spirit. And then I saw them burying my body. And then I went to this other realm and I met this being of light and I met my uncle. And at that point, you know, up to that point, it's very much like a near-death experience, you know, virtually identical. But then at that point, instead of being sent back to their body, they're sent to a new body in a new life. Uh, that's often chosen in, in conjunction with one of the afterlife spirits, but sometimes they just, you know, find themselves in, in a new body. So the significance of that is, is why would, you know, a two or three-year-old child or five-year-old child or whatever be able to accurate, accurately describe the near-death experience, essentially, of a previous personality when that child presumably had no knowledge of what near-death experiences were. And that, that similarity between near-death experiences and, and intermission memories, I think, is, is really interesting. And um, it could possibly be, you know, support the, the hypothesis that the kid really is remembering a past life. It, it's kind of a little little bit more, uh, another piece in the evidential puzzle, I guess I could say. Yeah, yeah, very interesting, yeah. Now, you have mentioned this, but I want to emphasize on this more. Uh, you, you mentioned that different postmodern faith awaits different people. Now, you know, for many of the people, or le at least the majority of the people that whom I talk to or, uh, you know, interact with in my field work uh, cannot imagine a, a life where you do not have an afterlife right and i mean many people for many people the reason for b there being an afterlife is uh, the question of okay ban suffering justice and all of those aspects right in, in, there need to be a solution to all of those things and the solution is that uh, you know there needs to be afterlife now there are different conceptions people conceive afterlife differently and also there are also people who doesn't really believe in this thing right that we are once we are dead we are biologically dead and nothing after that and you, here you mentioned that okay different faith may await different people and you also say that you know philosophically it might be viable in that sense so please elaborate this one more yeah, I should say too that near-death experiences aren't determined by belief. So even atheists will have near-death experiences, and that will often change their perceptions of an afterlife. They not might not become religious or convert to a particular religion or even believe in God, um, but I think you can have a coherent belief in an afterlife without believing in God or, or being a member of a religion. So, um, so yeah, I think um, I think it's possible that. Um, you know, there is this, I, I wouldn't say, I guess I should, uh, <laughs> so I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, when I was saying earlier about lucid dreams and about the afterlife being kind of co-created, I think it's maybe not quite that it's, we're creating it, but that we're imposing our own symbols and our own beliefs and our own background on it. We're kind of superimposing it. So for example, um, if, uh, if we were to go to the afterlife and there's a place where there's a village and a native American might person might see like from the 19th century might see uh, a, a village of teepees and his ancestors come riding up on horses and a girl he knew rides up on a horse. Um, and they're his deceased relatives. Whereas for me, um, you know, I might see it in terms of an American or a European city, you know, might be like a city that I really like, like Venice or Lisbon or something. Um, and I might see my uh, ancestors in clothes that they wore um, in, in ways that, that I would imagine them to be. So I think um, that doesn't mean that either of those cases are necessarily true or necessarily false, but they could be essentially the same thing, but just 
we're we're clothing them with symbols that are relevant to us. Um, and in the case of the the relatives or or the deceased friends or or ancestors or whatever, um, you know, those might just be they could be projections on, on our idealizations of them, but they, you know, they they could also just be what they what they appear to be. They might be the actual you know spirits of those people. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of it just comes down to belief and uh, speculation and inference to the best uh, evidence. Um, and is yeah, it's really kind of down to the individual, what you find reasonable, what you don't. Yeah, I know. I'm also kind of inclined to your statement that, you know, different postmodern faith awaits uh, different people. Uh, you know, <laughs> we cannot really verify as to what is uh, out there, but then I think somehow with all the evidences that are out there, I think this can be one of the viable options that uh, we can go towards. Yeah, so I just, just want to add one thing before that uh, on that subject. The interesting thing about, and the important thing about differences between near-death experiences is it challenges, I think, both people who want to believe in an afterlife and, and people who want to, to debunk it and say that it, there's not really an afterlife. And, and the reason for that is materialist theories that say NDEs are just the result of a dying brain, they say things like, you know, the, 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 the darkness that you enter is because of lack of oxygen, the brightness is a burst of energy in the brain at the last moment, the life review is a, is a you know, burst of activity and all these kinds of things. But as I mentioned earlier, the life review doesn't happen cross-culturally. So if near-death experiences were just based in the brain, then we would expect them to be pretty much identical between any person because our brains are essentially identical. But then at the same time, people who want to believe in an afterlife also want it to be the same for everybody because they want it to correspond to their religious beliefs. And they want it to be, you know, they want to know, quote unquote, that they're going to go to heaven or hell or be reincarnated or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I th I th that's why the differences I think are so important and so interesting because it's a challenge on, on both sides. And then you get philosophers like Keith Augustine, Sam Harris, who say things like near death experiences can't be true uh, because of the fact that they're different across cultures. And and to me that's what, that doesn't make any sense. To to me it's more like the difference is is more likely to make them true, if anything. Yeah, yeah. I've exhausted my questions now. So is there anything that uh, you want to mention from the book that which is very important or which might be very important for the listeners to know? Yeah. Um, I think we we more or less covered it. I mean, there's the, as far as you know from an academic standpoint, there's there's the appendix chapter which talks about the kind of the way near-death experiences have been received in the humanities, especially um, and particularly in religious studies, this idea that because the theory is, or, the, or the, rather the, um, the assumption is that there's no such thing as a cross-cultural experience that can lead to a religious belief because all experience is culturally generated. So I just talk about how a cross-cultural experience like the near-death experience is a challenge to those kinds of you know, um, constructivist kinds of attitudes that, that want to say, you know, there is no experience. It's all, everything is culturally generated. So, um, so that, and also I think just, um, I didn't really go into it much in the book, but people who feel that their beliefs are challenged by this material and, and people who are kind of rebel against it. And by the same token, people who are afraid of dying because they think that, you know, because of the religious indoctrination, they think they're going to suffer and go to hell or that they're going to be reborn in a, a nearly infinite number of times before they can get off this, this, you know, cycle of samsara or whatever. I would say that it's probably a lot more diverse than that and a lot more complicated than that. And, and to kind of, I just want to encourage people to not be afraid of, of death and dying because that's not the message that comes through in any of these cultures or experiences around the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So is there any other project uh, that you're working on currently that we should be interested of or should look out for? And also, if people like to reach out to you regarding your book, how do they reach out to you? Uh, yeah, I'm on pretty much all the, the social media um, under my own, my own name, uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and everything. Um, my website is gregoryshushan.com. Um, the new book, The Next World, is on Amazon or wherever you, you buy books. Um, my previous two books are, the first one's out of print, and that's going to be reprinted in a new edition, which I'm revising um, probably 
in 2024. Uh, the second one, Near Death Experience in, in Indigenous Religions, it's currently only in hardcover, very expensive, like $85, but it's going to have a paperback next year. So if people are interested in that, um, it'll be out then. But the next world is probably the best place to start. The others, you know, if you're, people are still interested to, to dive deeper um, than to go into those. I'm also putting together um, a historical anthology of near-death experiences, and that's just going to be a collection of ver- verbatim accounts from around the world um, in translation, just if people want to read the actual accounts rather than reading my interpretations and discussions of them. And then after that, <laughs> the next one's going to be... Um, it's called, going to be called uh, To Die and Rise Again, and the subtitle is Near-Death Experiences in Classical Antiquity, and I'm going to look at um, Greek and Roman and early Christian and um, not early Jewish because there aren't any, but I'm going to try to figure out why there aren't any in, in early Judaism. Thank you very much, Dr. Shoshan, for being here at New Books Network. I mean, conversing with you, I mean, I can really see the tape of your academic work in that sense and that's something which is very wonderful and interesting and i would also encourage the listeners that if anyone wants to dig more on narrative experience then obviously uh, dr gregory soshan is the right person to go to and i think this has been such a wonderful conversation dr uh, soshan and and yeah until next time see you yeah thank you bye well thanks so much yeah